Hello, my name is Alan Foom, and today I'm going to give you a basic primer on oil and gas economics. Now, this is a basic introduction, and I would really recommend that uh, you would talk to a professional economist, but this is to enable geologists, engineers to have an understanding of what economists do and to be able to have more productive conversations with them. Honestly, they don't bite. So, how do carbon companies use economic analysis for making decisions on investments? You know, are we going to drill uh, this particular prospect? Are we going to develop this particular field? And there's several factors that are used within this, and I'll explain them. Um, mainly, I'm going to focus on net present value, but there's also rate of return, profitability index, and there's also expected monetary value, which is used when taking risk into account. I did a video earlier on using Bayesian um, theory in uh, making economic decisions. Please have a look on that. And that explains the EMV a little bit better. So what is net present value? So it's the sum of cash flows over the life of project going forwards from today. So we ignore what is spent before, so sunk cost fallacy doesn't happen. Looking forward. And we discount these cash flows each year by the discount rate because of the time value of money. If the NPV is positive, then the project should be good. If the NPV is negative, then the project would be uh, poor. Well, it's not quite as simple as that because companies have hurdles and the internal rate of return is the discount rate with the NPV equals zero. And here's the formula for those who are formula minded. So what do we have as inputs? We've got our income stream. So that's oil and liquid sales, gas sales, third party tariff income. If we're using a facility to host other facilities and any tax rebates that we may have, particularly if we can offset expiration, etc., against tax. And our costs are the expiration expenditure, appraisal expenditure, um, capex, which is capital expenditure involved in setting up the field, so that's drilling wells, installing facilities, etc. Operating expenditure, which is the daily uh, cost of actually producing, so that's both fixed opex and um, variable opex, which is related to production. Decommissioning expenditure, far forward into the future, where we clean up and remediate the site. Any transport tariffs, so if we have to pay tariffs to a third party for processing our hydrocarbons, we pay those, and also taxes and royalty payments, depending on the different type of uh, uh, fiscal regime that uh, the country that we operate has. And I've got a video on that as well. So a little bit about hurdle rates. Now, obviously, uh, John just says it's got an MPV of uh, positive, therefore we go ahead. Uh, different companies look at uh, different things. Now, obviously, the MPV has to be positive. Internal rate of return might need to be above a certain threshold. Generally, that's to do with the weighted cost of capital of a company. I'll come to, to why that might be important, etc. Then there's a profitability index, uh, P over I, needs to be above required threshold. Uh, you must also have a little look at payback time and maximum financial exposure. So if you're down three billion at the at the peak rate, that might be a little bit hard to do. And different partners within a joint venture may have different hurdle rates. And then we use a different NPV discount factor, which can be a bit of a problem in some joint ventures. Price decks. Now, a price deck is a common set of assumptions used throughout an organization for future oil and gas companies. And generally, people would tend to use three price decks. There's would be a low, a mid, and a high. And that would vary along, uh, amongst companies. It would vary also through time. So each year, you may use a different price deck depending on what... Uh, the market fundamentals part of the economics department thinks is going to be the future. Price decks can be flat, so let's say for sake of argument, $50 flat into eternity, or it could be indexed to inflation, could be a measure of forward curves, so that's uh, from the futures market, indexing, etc. You would have uh, variations within the oil price deck, depending on uh, the uh, density of the oil. Heavy oil tends to tend to have a slight discount. There'll be separate de decks for natural gas liquids, which again have different. Uh, different uh, values and there could be gas decks indexed either to local markets such as henry hub mbp jkt etc lng prices uh, i have a video when a boe is not a boe uh, which explains the different types of prices that are there so we're going to look at a fictional oil field in the country of albonia fictional country the south atlantic has a tax royalty system five percent royalty on gross production 50 percent tax on profits there's a capex cost recovery spread throughout field life. Got a fictional oil field in deep water, uh, FBSO, production, using a floating production uh, uh, system. 10 wells, 148 million barrels. It's an uh, oil field. The gas will be reinjected. Mid case assumes $50 oil price. 
$10.5 development cost, $12 operating cost, which are kind of roughly what you'd expect right now. I mean, obviously that would vary a little bit. We'll look at the sensitivities as well. So this is a production profile. So that's a production rate in barrels of oil per day. And these are the different cases. So volume 70 is 70% of mid-case volume, 85, 85% of mid-case volume, um, mid-case volume, then 115, 115%, 130%, and 130 with a long tail, where you cap a production rate. Now, obviously, this will be the maximum production rate of the FBSO facility. And the long tail means that you have you can get away with building a smaller FBSO, but you just get a bit of production later. So again, we'll look at what these different things do. So this is the cash flow diagram. So in blue is CapEx. In uh, light blue is, uh, is tax. Then you have your revenue. And then you have your OPEX. And these are the little CapEx um, uh, infill production, infill, etc. And that's your decommissioning expenditure. So that's your start of production after about four years, which is roughly how long I feel like that would take to do. So you have 1.7 billion CapEx, 1.78 billion OPEX. 7.4 billion in revenue and 2.1 billion in tax and royalty under this particular system that the Albonians have. And we'll come to how that varies in a minute. So, this is your cash flow diagram. So, that's your cumulative uh, pre tax cash flow. Yeah, that looks pretty healthy. Then, this is after the government takes a share. Again, it's Albonia's oil, therefore, they take a tax and a royalty share. And then, this is after the cash flow discount because what happens is that Revenue at this part of the curve is discounted at 10% a year. So money coming in here is worth a lot less than money coming in here. Your maximum financial exposure, 1.29 uh, billion. And the break even in this particular case is at $41. So that's the different cash flow curves using cumulative cash flow. Okay, internal rate of 14%, that seems not too bad. Okay, but what if we got the inputs wrong? So let, oh, all the inputs are different. So we've got sensitivities here. We've got oil price. So we've got DEX at 30, 50, and 70. OPEX at 9, 12, 15 a barrel. And volume minus 30 plus 30. So you can see the big sensitivity here is actually the oil price. So if the oil price goes to $70, you make a heck of a lot more money with this particular tax system. Extra volumes give you a little bit more. Um, and uh, uh, volumes, low volumes are negative. So low oil price, low volume are the things you worry about. Low capex, okay, it's quite a big discount, but not too bad. And then you've got OPEX, etc. And these are the different upsides and downsides. So this is a tornado chart that people use to explore sensitivities. So these are different sensitivities to oil price. So using a $30 deck, never going to fly under these circumstances. Using a $40 deck, well, we worked out that break even is actually at 41. So it's almost there. Maybe you can shave off a bit of cost to try to get above the line, but it don't look too healthy. $50 looks pretty healthy. $60 looks very healthy. $70 looks very healthy indeed. Anything obviously above that is, uh, is, uh, is dreamland. Well, it was when I originally did the work, although current oil price is a little bit, bit above that, but you can never rely on that. Sensitivities on CapEx, so capital expenditure up front. So if you have a 20% overrun, you lose quite a lot of value. If you have a 20% underrun, you gain quite a bit of value. So looking and trying to optimize your CapEx to try to design things the right way and execute things the right way, which is actually the hardest part, you make a big deal. Sensitivities to recoverable volume. So again, if you get extra volume, if you have more than what you expected in terms of recovery, you get extra value. Um, if you get less, it's 85%, you lose 15%, you're still, still okay. If you lose 30% um, of volume, less than what you think, not so good. So you want to make sure that you constrain that using an appropriate appraisal program. Sensitivity to scale capex. So this is looking at well, what happens if we know that it's going to be uh, the volume is going to be less or the volume is going to be more. So for example, high volume with a scaled capex is uh, looking pretty healthy, but the long tail where you use a mid-case size FBSO just producing for a lot longer gives you the best value of all, even though quite a lot of that is relatively late in life. And if you have low volume but appropriately scaled CapEx, so you know you're going to have a low volume, so you scale your facility accordingly, you become positive. So again, appraisal works, knowing what you have works. Trying to get that uh, constraint as much as possible. 
Next one is sensitivity discount rates. Now, not everybody uses 10%. Some larger companies, particularly the majors and maybe the state oil companies, may use lower discount rates because they have bigger access to capital. For example, a major Asian national oil company may be funded by a major na national bank of that Asian country. Therefore, the cost of capitals will be a lot less than it is for an independent. So you have a 10% discount rate, you get 261. 7% discount rate, 539, that looks a bit better. Whereas if you go to 12, it's 122. And if you go to 15, it's negative. IRR was 14%. So if you're dealing with a small independent that has uh, much more constraints in terms of capital than a larger company, because they have to borrow uh, money, through either through bonds or bank loans, they have a problem. So maybe if you're a small independent, you might want to get out of this project by selling it to somebody to whom it is more value. But if you stay in there, you can have quite a big mismatch within a joint venture. And then sensitivity to tax changes. Now, Elbonia may think, hmm, price has gone up. We want to take more tax. Uh, it's not just Elbonia. Britain's just done that as well with full, windfall tax and oil companies. So if you increase your royalties to 10, 15 percent, you decrease the NPV at, um, at your $50 price stack. 60% profit tax or 15% royalty would uh, more than halve the NPV. And if you take a 70% profit tax, it becomes negative at the $50 oil price deck. If you take a 10% royalty, 60% profit tax, you know it's coming up to um, significantly less than, uh, than what we had before, you know, less than a third. If you have a 70% uh, uh, $70 price deck, so oil prices have gone up, the Albonian government has increased taxes, you get 330, still more than the original, but a lot less than 800. So Albonia takes a much fair, much larger share of the, uh, of the revenue. As the $40 price stack, but they may get 40% uh, tax, that gets the project above the line. Now, if the oil price goes up, the Albonia may increase the profits tax. Now, a French uh, 17th century uh, finance minister called Colbert said, you know, the art of taxation is maximum feathers, minimum hissing. Maybe the Albonian uh, finance minister is one of his disciples. And the question that we need to ask as well is, do we have the right sensitivities? Are these really the most sensitive factors? Is the range right? You know, people use a funnel, uh, you know, plus 20%, minus 20%, etc. But is it too wide or too narrow? Um, you know, is there a discrepancy? For example, you could have high costs and low volume you know, high costs in a low price environment. We need to just check and double check what we do. What can we control? What can we mitigate? And how effective are the mitigations, you know, discussions with the Albanian government? What factors can we change in the short term between approval and execution? You know, how can we do things better? How can we do things smarter? Should the ranges be symmetrical? Is there an asymmetric uh, sensitivity that we need to look at? And how realistic are the inputs? Are, is this systemic bias? And have we identified everything significant? You know, what are the forgotten unknowns? What are the unknown unknowns that we can think of? And have we had any outside opinions? You know, are we guilty of clique think? And where is the true economic hurdle? So that's something we need to think about and uh, companies to think about to make the right decisions. So just to sum up, uh, non-economists, geologists and engineers need to have a basic understanding of, e of economics, trying to make the right decisions try to be able to talk to economists, try to understand what's going on. And we need to use economic analysis to make rational decisions. Unfortunately, however, some people do try to gain the system by varying the inputs, and different co ventures may have different hurdle rates which can have problems with the joint venture. The inputs can be subjective. Now, we try to get them as reasonably accurate as forecast as possible, but CapEx, OPEX production profiles, these are all effectively forward estimates which are subject to us getting them wrong. And the price is often the sensitivity to the greatest impact, and it's generally unpredictable. So hopefully that helps you understand a little bit about what economics do, so you can have really productive conversations with The Economist. Thank you very much. Please like, please subscribe, and I'll see you on the next one.